Aloha, and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Esaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with former First Lady of Hawaii, Vicky Cayetano. She, was, uh, she has recently expressed her desire to run for governor herself, and Ben may become the first man of Hawaii. Her family had humble beginnings, and she had worked to become a successful business person. She even was an actress who was starring with Elvis Presley in the musical film, It Happened at the World's Fair. Vicky, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. And please tell us about yourself, starting from your uh, family's escape from poverty in China to the Philippines, then to Hawaii, working your way up the ladder of success, to owning a company with 1,200 workers. Vicky? Aloha, Dennis, and thank Aloha. you for having me on your show today. Well, I was born in the Philippines. Uh, my parents were also born in the Philippines, and my grandparents came from China. Uh, we came to this country through the goodness, the good graces, I say, of my sister, Ginny, who was a very talented pianist and artist. She was discovered while we were in the Philippines uh, by a friend who knew Ed Sullivan. And of course, back then, Ed Sullivan was probably the number one variety show. And he saw my sister, five years old, playing the piano, and he couldn't believe it. So he sent the tape, back then it was the old recording tape, and sent it to Ed Sullivan. And he said, when can she come over here? And so Ginny came over and a year later, the rest of our clan, nine children, uh, we all came to, to this country, and uh, my dad had intended to go back, but uh, by the goodness of everyone supporting us, we were able to stay in this beautiful place, and uh, we grew up on the mainland. And also through Jenny is how I got my break uh, performing with Elvis Presley in the movie It Happened at the World's Fair. So Ginny had already been on a, a, been in a movie called Girls, Girls, Girls with Elvis Presley. And actually she had a very small part, but she did well enough that when the producer, Ted Richmond wanted to do another movie and it called for an Asian young lady, he asked Jenny to uh, play again the role. Uh, but she had already been committed to perform for President Kennedy and she plays the piano. I cannot play the piano. <laughs> so my father was very resourceful and he said, hmm, I think I'll send my other daughter to take on this role. So I walked in with a guardian accompanying me, no family with me. And even at six and a half, I knew that they were not expecting me just by the looks on their faces. So I read for the part and I got it and spent about three months in Seattle at the 1962 World's Fair uh, with Elvis Presley and also spent part of that filming in, in Hollywood. You know, back then it was very different. People learned by going to these exhibitions, right? The New York World's Fair and Seattle, uh, that's where the genesis of all the Microsoft and all that, that's where it all started was that, that World's Fair. And it's also, the World's Fair, where the Belgian waffle, the Belgian waffle debuted. Did you know that? Know. They debuted in 1962, and there is a scene of me eating the the waffle. <laughs> I really love to eat. I still do. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I got my part. My sister still performs. Uh, I gave that up a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, I started doing laundry 34 years ago. So how did you start in the laundry business? So the laundry was really the brainchild of Masaichi Tasaka. Mr. Tasaka was then president of Kuakini Hospital. His idea was that healthcare should really focus on their core business and that uh, they should not be doing laundry. But he explained to me that every time he tried to create a laundry, a co-op laundry, uh, the politics of all the hospitals would get into play. And so he finally started thinking that if he got outsiders to come in and manage the laundry 
and the hospitals would just be a customer. It was very interesting, but then I looked into Waikiki and I see all these hotels and I'm thinking, why would you use prime real estate in Waikiki to operate a laundry? And from there began United Laundry with three hospitals, uh, myself managing it, and then it grew to where we invited two hotel uh, ownerships, the Kyoya Group that owned the Sheraton Waikiki, Moana Weston, Royal Hawaiian, Princess Kaiulani, and the Sheraton Maui. Uh, and then also after that, the Outrigger uh, family. And, and so for many years, the six of us were partners in this laundry venture. It's been very, very rewarding, but it's hard to believe that 34 years have gone by so quickly. It's very uh, important uh, part of uh, the hospitals right now, the hotels also, right, with the pandemic. That's right. You know, uh, it may not be a glamorous business. I remember when we first started sorting, you know, soil laundry uh, from healthcare, nursing homes, and then washing. It did everything except drive a truck. Never been a good driver. <laughs> so I did not drive a truck, but everything else I did with our initial group of 25 employees uh, and steadily, slowly and steadily through everyone's dedication and commitment. You know, we grew the business. We were uh, pre-pandemic. We were about 1,200 employees throughout the state. Uh, but yeah, it's not a glamorous business, but it's definitely an essential service. And I love the people that work in this industry because they're very down to earth and we just want to do a job and take care of our customers. Um, that's all we want to do. Yeah, then I read somewhere during a uh, pandemic when the hotels closed down, you know, it was a big hit on the company, right? Very difficult, like uh, many of our other, you know, businesses in this in this state. I had never seen anything like that in 33 years back last year, where so many employees, you know, all of us either had to take cuts in our schedules or many even furloughed. Uh, I'm just so grateful, though, that at least we have a government that has social programs unemployment benefits that could support those who were not able to continue working. You know, at least we're blessed to live in this country, in this state where we really, you know, take care of each other. Yeah. Um, a while back, uh, I read that uh, yourself and some others, including OHA trustee of Stander, Paul Kosasa and others, uh, help to save or revive the symphony. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, really a privilege to be working with people like Paul Kasasa and Ostender. So what happened was the former symphony, the Honolulu Symphony, had filed bankruptcy. And a group of us were very concerned because it's not just about playing concerts for a few people. It's about music education in our schools, to our young people. We are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And if we don't have those musicians here to teach our students, what kind of hope do they have for the future? Um, every state in this country has a symphony orchestra, every state. So in our mind, how could Hawaii be the only state without it especially given our logistics and where we're positioned here. And, and so we banded together as a team. And thanks to the Kasasa family, I worked with the trustee because it had gone into bankruptcy, worked with the trustee to get them to sell all the assets of the symphony as a lot versus individual pieces. Because if it's sold individually, a lot of people could have bought a small piece of it and then you couldn't keep the symphony intact anymore. So the Casasas uh, put up the money to buy all these assets so that we could form the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And that's important because Honolulu Symphony uh, notates playing for Honolulu. 
Hawaii Symphony is a symphony orchestra to support the entire state from Kauai to the Big Island. Yeah, that's great. Um, but the company also supported some other nonprofits too. Can you mention some of the things you've been involved with? So our leadership and our company has always been about giving back and supporting the community that you know gives you so much. And so, yes, we've support over 40 different organizations um, from Food Bank, IHS, Institute of Human Services, anything that can, you know, has an impact to our community, uh, we want to be a part of it. But the symphony is a wonderful story because it's been now 10 years later and uh, the music is still playing. As recently as this year, out at the Waikiki Shell, we had some wonderful outdoor concerts for our residents and visitors to enjoy as well. I, I think to me, that is what's really meaningful about one's life is what you leave behind, not just what you enjoy, because you can't take anything with you, but what you leave behind and the legacy you leave behind is really important. Yeah, it's, um, it's great. I remember that time I was thinking symphony. I think it was Jerry Spence, the attorney and author. He was at 24, Imelda Marcos. In this book, he said something like, oh, some people will, you know, step over a dying man in the street to get to the symphony or opera or something. Like so I was thinking like, oh, is that what it is? I'm glad that, you know, it's it. And I told, I told you that, so it, I'm glad it's, uh, you're concerned about, you know, everybody. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's also our musicians, you know, yeah. them if you meet yeah, them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a I, lifetime uh, no, for them quote, to hold their quote, craft. I just quote, quoting what he said. <laughs> that came to mind. Um, you know, you seem to have a comfortable life now. Uh, why would you uh, want to run for governor? You know, <laughs> my friends ask me that. Vicky, you have, a, you have a good head on your shoulder. <laughs> why are you running for governor? <laughs> well, seriously. You know, our state has never been, I think, at a more critical juncture than where we are right now. Uh, and with this pandemic, the economy, uh, where it's at, what kind of tourism are we going to have in this pandemic and post-pandemic world? What about our climate? What about a plan for COVID, climate change? Uh, if you read the, the paper today, you know, the median home is over a million dollars. How many young people can afford to stay here? And how many have already left us? And if the future of Hawaii is not staying in Hawaii, <laughs> what kind of future will we have? All those things really weigh heavily uh, on my heart. And, and I've been thinking about it for a while. And, and uh, I just feel that the time is right. I have no, no agenda here. I have a great job, wonderful family. Uh, I don't need to do this, but I have to do it because I care so much. And you're once a uh, Republican, but now you're a Democrat. Well, I was never active in politics, you know, between working and then raising two right. children um, and running a laundry is a very tough job. I mean, people in the in the industry know it's literally 24-7. Uh, I never really had time to do anything else except family and work, like so many people. Right. And the Republican Party that I was a member of 25 years ago, up to 25 years ago, was a very different Republican Party, you know. But I've been a Democrat for the past 24 years. And my values of pro-choice, of urgency in addressing climate change and global warming, warming and uh, minimum wage for working people. Those are values that are really at the heart of what the Democratic Party stands for. And uh, I'm very proud to share those values and to represent them in the community. We run for office. Uh, a lot of times it matters who your friends are, who's behind you. I uh, read that you've been working with um, Lynn Waters, Loretta Sheehan, 
Alan Tang and Vicky Borges. Who are they? So Vicky is a friend, of course, widow of Jimmy Borges and a dear friend. We've known each other for years. She worked at United Laundry. I was privileged to have her as my executive assistant until the furlough situation with COVID hit so many people in our company. Uh, she's helping me organize my schedule, which is one of the most important things, as you know, <laughs> trying to keep juggle a million things. Uh, I continue to work in the laundry. Um, like so many people in the state, I have two jobs now. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm very fortunate to have a great group of people involved and many also advising and giving, you know, sharing their concerns, whether it's small business, uh, people in the environmental world, uh, so many issues that we have to tackle from education, healthcare, affordable housing, cost of living, native Hawaiian issues, uh, something dear to my heart. I call it the humanities, animal welfare, and the arts. Uh, because to me, it's not just about surviving. I'm running to make an impact to really better people's lives so you can thrive. And not just to survive, you know, life is too short to just survive. We should be able to enjoy these times with our family. And when people are living paycheck to paycheck and barely making it, uh, when they cannot buy a home, that's beyond their reach. Those are the things that really bother me. And I, I'm running to do something about that. But I think the two most urgent issues that we have to deal with is COVID, a plan for COVID-19 and uh, variants that will be coming. We're already seeing the Delta variant. Uh, and the second C, I call it, is climate change. You know, we need to start recognizing the urgency of that. You see it already, you know, in on Kauai in 2018, the rain bomb that you folks had, right? North Shore. Here, when you drive along Kamehameha Highway, you see the erosion of the coastline. Waikiki, concern there. I mean, it's just on every island, we have issues about climate change that must be addressed with urgency and priority. Yeah, uh, all of those things you mentioned, climate change, you know, sea level rise and all that, you know, we have to uh, do something about it before it gets us. Um, also, housing, affordability of housing and jobs. Um, I know you've helped with, you know, over a thousand jobs. Uh, but people have a hard time uh, buying a house, which median price is what, a uh, million dollars or something. So, Can what do you believe that? Yeah, what, what do you say about that? So one of the things I will say is when you look at the magnitude of our problems, what it needs is it needs somebody in my mind who's going to look at it from a new perspective, because small incremental change isn't going to have any material significant impact creating solution. The other thing I think that's really important is like you, when you run your business, to make it work, you reach out to everyone, your employees, your customers, your vendors. It takes everyone coming together. And that's something I've been doing my whole life. You know, we don't have the luxury of saying we don't want to work with this party or that segment of, of the uh, group. We, we don't have that luxury in the private sector. We have to work with everybody. And that is my message in governing, that we need to work with everyone bring people together. Uh, we're not always going to agree, but we need to have those discussions and move decisively to implement the right kind of solutions to, to, be, to not be afraid, to try, because that's the only way that we're going to create solutions to the big problems that we're facing. And I also pride myself as somebody who, who is into details. You know, you can talk about I want to make life better for people. But what does that really mean? And so in my business, it's all about <laughs> all the details that are needed to create a successful plan. We have a lot of good people with great ideas, 
but implementing and execution requires another set of skills. Yeah, I think housing, like other businesses, like probably in your business, you know, they, they got to be laws, you know, and rules. But uh, in housing, uh, I think sometimes we got uh, some of the restrictions and conditions uh, that prevent more housing, you know. For the regular people, and then it comes down to okay, the government, or we get to we'll do it then. And so, and I don't think it's gonna be all the government gonna do the pull, you know, affordable housing, which is another thing. Just calling it affordable housing, it's not really affordable, you know. But the affordable category is like half a million. It's, not really affordable to a lot of people. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much you've been into housing, but uh, it, there is a big issue along with jobs, like you said, pandemic. Uh, what do you think about the jobs now? So I think that tourism is something that's always going to be our number one industry. There's nothing that's going to quite replace it, especially in a very short time. But having said that, I really think that one has to define sustainable tourism. I think that all of us who are in this industry would recognize that this, this last year, the uptick and the type of, of uh, unmanaged tourism um, is very concerning for residents and also for the right kind of visitors. So I, I definitely think that that needs to be addressed and discussed. And, you know, to me, that cannot be a separate entity that's not working together with the state government. I think state government does need to be uh, more involved in terms of uh, supporting, but also oversight of how the tourism, uh, the visitor industry uh, works. And I think there's been a, a little bit of a disconnect. And I'm sure that that's something that will be addressed. Certainly, I see that as a priority to work more in partnership together. Yeah, I, and when uh, we opened up the state and all the tourists started to come, like we got uh, hotels were full, people couldn't get cars, and traffic, yeah, traffic was bad. But now we spoke to someone who works in a hotel in Waikiki. They're down in the 60 something percent occupancy now. So it's kind of been cutting down. I don't know if it's because of the governor's plea for them to not come here. Uh, where do you see it going? So that is one of my perhaps the biggest priority is to come up with a plan to address the COVID-19 so that we can create Hawaii to be the safest place to visit to live in it will take consistency across all islands not one county to the other because I think that creates confusion it will take understanding and to an extent Obviously, the different stakeholders need to understand and buy in, but that to me is a very critical goal so that we don't have to live on this roller coaster ride of going up and down. We can't afford more shutdowns, and yet without a lockdown, this thing seems to be getting out of control. We need hospitals to be open, not only for COVID uh, people, but for those who need other services as well. And so that's top of my priority as I campaign to be the next governor. Right. Uh, yeah, a lot of these things uh, surround uh, the pandemic plans. Uh, it's uh, jobs, tourism, you know, right now there's uncertainty and uh, we need a good leader. Uh, and uh, coupled with the normal issue, like you said, the normal people who go to the hospitals and you know, other topics like Native Hawaiian, you know, uh, 
mm-hmm. the issues or you know things that we gotta uh, deal with. You know, get only focus on on the pandemic, but meanwhile you get <laughs> people trying to make a living. That's right. Yeah. You're absolutely right, but we need to get a handle on COVID so we can talk about all these other important issues. But I have a lot uh, that I'll be rolling out on my website. So when you have time, I hope you'll check it out, Dennis. www.vickyforgovernor.com But I'll be rolling out what what I'm working on. But to me, yeah, climate change and a plan to deal with COVID-19 so we're not on this wild ride of uncertainty which leads to a lot of frustration, anger, you know, everybody's just like, <laughs> so we, we've got to cut, get this under control and we can yeah. get it under control, but we have to have a plan. Yeah, kind of, kind of backtrack. I mean, you know, everything is, you know, life's lessons, but going back to college, you went to Stanford. What did you study? Well, I didn't graduate from Stanford. I went oh. for two years. And uh, and then I, I started a business and somehow too much being too much of an entrepreneur, if I had to look back, that is probably one of the things that I would say I regret is not completing that. No, no, you, you did a lot, um, you did a lot more than a lot of college grads. Uh, was it? I started. Um, I graduate work in urban planning, so I'm a dropout there. I'm also a dropout from uh, Dale Carnegie class. <laughs> and both of them were the, because of the two hurricanes. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you speak very well. No, 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 no. So you no. have your own show. No, yeah, doing no. great. No. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I thought was kind of funny, I think. I read somewhere that when you first, first met Ben, you see, you said he was down to earth. He didn't talk a lot, and he was very humble. That's <laughs> it's here. I don't know. I guess he learned to talk a lot more later. <laughs> um, we're getting close to the end. Any uh, closing statement? We got a couple of minutes. No, I just want to thank you for uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you and your audience and. Uh, I'm humbled to be able to make this run, you know, and uh, have an opportunity to serve And I'm going to do everything I can, earn your trust and your vote. Yeah, thank, yeah thanks for joining us. And, and thanks for everybody for listening to Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we'll be back again on Politics in Hawaii in two weeks. Thank you and aloha.